lunch today, we'll see. Grab your Bibles, if you will. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. When you find your place there, I'd also ask you to uh, find Romans chapter 3. So Matthew chapter 5, Romans chapter 3. Last week we began a new message series called Blessed. It is a message series that is going at, uh, to look at all of the Beatitudes that are contained here at the very beginning of Jesus and his Sermon on the Mount. So the second Beatitude that's found in verse number 4 of Matthew chapter 5 is startling. It says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, this, of course, is a paradox, and it's meant to grab our attention. The connection of the second beatitude with the first beatitude is both beautiful as it is compelling. The first beatitude that says, blessed are the poor in spirit, is primarily intellectual. It's, it's about those who understand that uh, before a holy and righteous God, we are spiritual beggars in desperate need of help from the outside. Now, the second beatitude Blessed are those that mourn uh, is the emotional counterpoint to the first beatitude. So it naturally follows that when we see ourselves for what and who we are, that our emotions would be stirred to a point of mourning. And so uh, the Bible is crystal clear when it comes to painting the picture of who we are apart from Christ. That's why I have you opened your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 3, because I want to show you what God's Word has to say about who we are apart from Jesus. And here, Paul strings together a series of Old Testament quotations so that he can describe our character, our conversation, and what our conduct looks like. In Romans chapter 3, beginning of verse number 10, he talks about our character. And he says, as the Scriptures say... No one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. And then he goes to talk about our conversation in verse 13. He says, their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are, are full of cursing and bitterness. So he addresses our character, talks about our conversation, and then he wraps it up with addressing our conduct in verse number 15. It says that they rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Now this is is who and, and what we are apart from Jesus Christ. And I would say that it is a great day in our lives when we are confronted with our individual sin. When we refuse to rationalize our sin. When we're willing to acknowledge and admit that what we've done or what we're doing is actually sinful. When, when we weep over our sin and we cry out to God, that is what is being talked about here in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 4, about mourning. Seeing our sin for what it is, seeing the sin of our nation, seeing the sin in the world, and mourning and crying out unto God. Mourning's not popular. Despite its necessity for spiritual health, mourning is definitely not in vogue today. The world despises sorrow so much that it goes to great lengths in order to try to avoid it. The world thinks that those who mourn, those who mourn over their own sin, those that mourn over the sins of the state, the sins of our nation, the sins in the world. There's a tendency for, for the world to look at those who mourn over sin and think that they're crazy or, or they're some religious fanatic. They're, they're, they're nut jobs or, or something. 
And then the church doesn't help it sometimes. Because there's some people who actually believe that if you're a good Christian, however you define that, filled with the Holy Spirit, then you're never going to experience sorrow. You're never going to experience heartache. You're never going to experience pain or misery. In fact, you'll wear an eternal plastic smile on your face, no matter what the situation says. There are preachers who although they maintain that they belong to the evangelical tradition, that absolutely refuse to speak or address sin from the pulpit because it tends to make un people unhappy. I think you know by now how I feel about your happiness. the result of all of this is a Christianity that is pathetically shallow, if indeed it's Christianity at all. In the matters of spiritual life and health, mourning is not optional. Spiritual mourning is necessary for salvation to occur. No one is truly a believer who has not mourned over his or her sins. You cannot be forgiven if you're not sorry for your sin. And so the saddest thing in life is not a sorrowing heart. I think the saddest thing in life is a heart that's incapable of grieving over sin because that heart is a heart that hasn't been moved by grace. And so the Greek verb mourn that's used here is the strongest term for mourning that's found in the Greek language. It's talking about a, a loud wailing. It's like the deep mourning and wailing that occurs at the, uh, at the loss uh, of a loved one. It is sorrow. It is a deep, desperate, helpless sorrow. Sorrow for sin. It's having a broken heart over evil and suffering. It's the brokenness that comes from seeing Jesus Christ nailed upon the cross and then making the realization that it's my sin that put him there. That's the mourning that we're talking about. Sin and irresponsibility cause all kinds of things in our lives. It causes regret, disappointment, guilt, Remorse, in short, sin causes sorrow. But here's what you need to understand. Sorrow in and of itself has no healing power. Only repentance, it's a change of heart, a change in the direction of our lives. It's only through repentance that the sorrowing heart might be healed. You, you do realize, hopefully, that there are two types of sorrow that one could have scripture tells us about it in fact it tells us about it in second corinthians chapter 7 verse number 10 the first sorrow that i would point out is the worldly sorrow this sorrow can be uh, the feelings of remorse or regret over doing something wrong or falling short of one's own personal expectation it is a sorrow that comes with the violation of one's values. It can also be a sorrow that's caused by being caught in an act that you'd wish you never were caught doing. Not in doing the act, but in being caught. Yeah. It's the sorrow that one feels sometimes from, from suffering the consequences of their actions. Not the regret and the remorse they have for the actions that brought about the, the consequences, but it's the actual suffering through the consequence, consequences that, that brings about sorrow. In either case, the sorrow of the world produces death, and that's what Scripture tells us. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, Whereas worldly grief 
produces death. Worldly grief produces death. Worldly sorrow ends in death. So how does it produce death? Let me give you two thoughts real fast. It produces death one way by eating away at a person. It eats away at a person with guilt and remorse. It eats away at a person with depression and despair. It eats away at a person with this mindset of defeat and a lifestyle of inactivity. If you want to see how worldly sorrow produces death and is empty of repentance, then you need look no further in your scriptures to the life of Judas. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 5. So one way it produces death is that it eats away at a person. Another way that it produces death is that it embitters a person. It embitters a person in rebellion and resentment against the consequences and the punishment of sin. Another example you can read about in Scripture is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. Here we see how uh, Esau was embittered in his sorrow. But so we have this worldly sorrow that produces death, but thankfully the Scripture also tells us about this thing that's called godly sorrow. Now, godly sorrow is a sorrow that is wrought by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's when someone who does something wrong or, or falls short of God's holy standard and the Holy Spirit moves in the life of that person to raise awareness to what they're doing is is wrong scripture teaches us in ephesians chapter 4 verse number 30 scripture says that when we do wrong and we fall so short those are really nice ways of saying when we sin when we sin according to ephesians 4 verse number 30 the holy spirit is grieved it grieves the holy spirit and then you see in second uh, i'm sorry first timothy Chapter 5, verse number 19. So not only does it grieve the Holy Spirit, but also the Holy Spirit's work is quenched because of sin. In other words, one of the, the aspects of what the Holy Spirit does in our life is that it helps to mature us in our faith so that we can grow in Christ-like maturity. But when we sin and when we rebel against that, then the work of the Holy Spirit is quenched in our life and what He's trying to accomplish in and through us is hindered because of sin. So the Holy Spirit will begin this convicting work and it's under the weight of this conviction that a believer's heart is thereby led to repent. Godly sorrow always leads to repentance. Always. And so without having a poverty of spirit, we talked about last week, no one can enter into the kingdom of heaven. Likewise, without its emotional counterpart, the grief over sin, no one can receive the comfort of forgiveness and salvation. And make no mistake, the sorrow that's being mentioned here in this beatitude is a sorrow that's related to sin. It's not the sadness that comes because your puppy died. That's not what he's talking about. It's not the sorrow that you feel in uh, losing your job. It's not the sorrow that you feel with the loss of a loved one. The sorrow that's talked about here is the sorrow, the grief, and the anguish that you feel over sin. Now, there are plenty of other verses in the Scriptures that talked about how God would help us and strengthen us and comfort us in times of loss. This just isn't that verse. you got to understand what's happening. So, so Jesus is telling us there is this progression that, ha that happens in our lives. First and foremost, we recognize that we are spiritually needy and we can do nothing about our salvation on our own. And overwhelmed with the conviction of the Holy Spirit because of sin in our life, then that causes us to grieve our condition and turn to Jesus. And so look at the reward that comes from our mourning. It says, Blessed are those who mourn, 
for they will be comforted. I want to point out that this comfort is actually immediate. Don't misinterpret the future tense that's being used here. It's not saying, blessed are those that, that, that mourn because eventually, sometime in the future, you're going to be comforted. The future tense is used merely to help us to understand the sequence of how things happen. Comfort comes after the mourning happens. So you have to mourn and grieve first before you can be comforted. So what Jesus is saying, blessed are the mourners, or, or the mourners are approved, for they are immediately comforted, and they will continue to be comforted. That's the essence of what Jesus is saying. There can be no comfort where there is no grief. And so that we're all clear that the basis of our comfort is forgiveness. Believers are the only people in the world that are free from the guilt of our sin. And so that word they is used emphatically. So the sense is blessed are, are those that mourn. For they and they alone will be immediately comforted and will be continuously comforted. The believers are the only one that can receive the comfort that our Lord has to offer. And so we actually know that we're mourners if we've experienced the comforting sense of God's forgiveness. And I love the Greek word that's used here for comforted. Because the root of this Greek word, uh, from it, we get the word paraclete. If you know anything about Greek, even on a most basic level, the, the paraclete is the term that we use in Greek to, um, for, for the Holy Spirit. So at the root of this word comfort is the word that we get Holy Spirit from. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who comes to guide us, the one that comes to give us comfort. Which means that God's comfort is relational. He personally binds up our sorrow and He consoles us. Not only is, is it relational, God's comfort comes to us and us alone. What I mean by us is those that belong to Him. It comes to us personally through the person of the Holy Spirit. And it's based upon the forgiveness of our sin. That's why He says blessed. That's why He says that we are approved. We're approved because our mourning has led us to God and we've experienced repentance and so now we're forgiven. So the reason why we're approved is because ultimately it's because we're forgiven. And how do we get to the point of being forgiven? It's by allowing our sorrow of our sin to turn and point us directly to Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that those who are not yet believers to you, please recognize that this paradox is meant to lead you to salvation. If a spirit of mourning is welling up inside of you, my word of encouragement to you is to let that mourning lead you directly to Jesus Christ. May you do what like, uh, the prodigal son does in Luke chapter 15. I'm not going to read the whole story. But if you know just a little bit about the story of the prodigal son, you know that there's a child who demands to receive something from the father that it wasn't his place or his time to demand it. Received the blessings of a dad and went out and wasted it all and lived a very foolish life. In the midst of all of that, in utter desperation and despair, the prodigal son recognizes his condition and he mourns over it. In the midst of his misery, listen to what he says. It says in Luke chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, the prodigal son says, I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father and 
But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Let me ask you, this morning, do you acknowledge that there is absolutely nothing that is within you that makes you acceptable unto God? That the only way that you're acceptable unto him is through faith and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. Are you mourning over the thought of sin? Are you mourning over the sin that's currently in your life? Does it produce grief? Does it produce sorrow at all? I'd like to share a couple of quotes with you this morning to kind of help to see this being played out in real life. The first one's going to come from a man by the name of Charles Colson. Maybe you recognize him more as Chuck Colson. Uh, Chuck Colson passed away some seven years ago, I believe, 2012. Uh, Chuck Colson was uh, the founder of Prison Fellowship and, and, and Breakpoint, but uh, almost in like in another lifetime ago, before... Uh, prison fellowship and all of that uh, developed in his life before he became uh, world-renowned as an evangelical Christian leader. Before all that, at one point in his life, uh, Chuck Colson served as the special counsel to President Richard Nixon. How many of you knew that? Sound familiar to you? In fact, uh, he was referred to as President Nixon's hatchet man. And, And so... Colson gained notoriety at the height of the Watergate scandal. In fact, uh, Chuck Colson was the first person under the Nixon administration to be incarcerated because of Watergate-related charges. I want you to look at what he had to say on the night that he became a believer and then take notice about the comfort that he received from his morning. He says, that night... When I sat alone in my car, my own sin, not just dirty politics, but the hatred and evil so deep within me was thrust before my eyes forcefully and painfully. For the first time in my life, I felt unclean. And worst of all, I could not escape. In those moments of clarity, I found myself driven irresistibly into the arms of the living God. Chuck, he got it. He understood. The poverty of spirit, the mourning over sin, and that led him directly into the arms of our Savior. Chuck Colson followed his mourning to God. And so can you. And then just this past week, as I'm working through the message, I believe it was on Tuesday, a man by the name of Paul Washer. Maybe you know him, maybe you don't. If you like to listen to people or or watch sermons online, I'd highly encourage you to check this guy out. He is absolutely solid, and he'll tell you exactly the way it is. Paul Washer had this, he tweeted this out this past Tuesday. He said that the mark of the true believer is not sinless perfection, but new repugnance for sin, a greater sensitivity to sin, a more vehement zeal to fight against sin, a humble uh, contrition because of sin, and a willingness to confess sin. Just let that sit there for just a moment. Does that describe who you are? Does that describe how you feel about sin? Do you ache with the guilt of your sin before a holy and righteous God? If so, and if you're a child of God, then then may you return and be restored in your fellowship with our Lord. Receiving the forgiveness that he's ever so eager and willing to grant. If you don't belong to him, you're not a child of God, you're not a Christian, a believer, however you want to call yourself, but but your sorrow has never led you directly to Jesus, oh, my prayer for you is that you would come to him now. 
receive the forgiveness that he has to offer. And like the prodigal son, oh, he will put his robe on your shoulder. He will put his ring on your hand. He'll put sandals on your feet. He'll prepare a feast for you. He'll welcome you home. What do you do with the sin of your life? If you belong to God, will you confess and repent from it and return into a proper relationship with Jesus? If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, asking for the complete forgiveness of sin, committing your life to to be lived unto him and for his glory, would you allow the spirit of mourning that wells up within you, would you allow it, like Chuck Colson did, to lead you directly into the arms of a living God? My prayer is that the answer is yes. My prayer is that as we move into a time of invitation, that the altar would be filled with individuals who aren't filled with pride, who don't worry about what other people are doing, who are willing just to come, to confess, to spend time alone. You don't have to come to the front. You can kneel, you can sit, you can stand exactly where you're at and get yourself right with the Father. My prayer is that we're not rushing out of here just to get to lunch before a crowd, but that we're going to take whatever time is necessary in this moment so that when we leave this place, we are in a proper relationship with our loving Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for your love for us. And God, thank you for the forgiveness that you offer. God, I pray that we would have sorrowing hearts over sin, that our hearts uh, would grieve over sin and, and help to produce within us a godly sorrow that leads to repentance that ultimately is fulfilled in salvation. So God, may we be comforted today by the forgiveness that you offer. And in this place, Father, may decisions be made right here, right now, that fully honor and glorify you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.